Welcome back, everyone. I'm Jordan Giesegi, and this is The Limiting Factor. This is the final video in the Battery Investor Day series. Rest assured, there will be more videos on the topic. I expect, at minimum, to do a live stream on the day and a follow-up video on my predictions. However, I felt there should be a final video for now to put a cherry on top. That is, to correct my errors, share new information, address points made in the comments, and restack what we can expect from Tesla's new battery chemistry based on the new information. Let's start with the errors. In the technical deep dive video, I shared this research paper. This is the first major area where my speculation was off. I referred to the paper as Shirley Mung's research paper because it involved Shirley's lab. However, this paper actually involved two labs. The second lab was the Army Research Laboratory. The first lead on the research was Judith Alvarado. Judith now works for Scylla Nanotechnologies, which should ring a bell for those of you who watched the technical deep dive video. The second lead was Marshall Schroeder who works for the Army Research Laboratory. The primary overseer of the paper was Kang Shu, also from the Army Research Laboratory. Kang Shu is one of the world's leading experts on electrolytes. There's a lot of interesting work coming out of the Army Research Laboratory, and I may do a video on them in the future, or alternatively, an entire video on the military's interest in battery technology. The second correction is that this chemistry probably won't be the chemistry Tesla uses in their upcoming batteries. I selected this paper because the chemistry hit the right notes. That chemistry was LINMO, or lithium nickel manganese oxide. It was cobalt-free, which would reduce costs, high energy density, non-flammable, and the chemistry was slated to be tested with Maxwell's dry electrode technology so I expected it was within striking distance of commercialization. However, the one drawback we discussed was that it didn't appear to have the excellent cycle life required to hit 1 million miles. We had to rely on some speculation to get there. It turns out that speculation was too optimistic. The paper indicates that the Linmo MCMB full cells were tested at a C5 cycling rate, and the material cost of this new electrolyte is unknown in the context of a commercial application. In other words, it would be a stretch for the chemistry to last a million miles, and it might be expensive. MCMB stands for mesocarbon microbeads, which is just a type of graphite anode, and a C5 cycling rate is a cycling rate of 5 hours for charge and discharge. While this electrolyte system is a promising route to make use of the high voltage capability of Linmo, it would be difficult to scale this material for the thousands of tons Tesla would need. Extensive safety testing, long-term storage, and long-term cycling also needs to be completed before it can be considered for any commercial application. I also overestimated the specific energy of the cathode material. The specific energy of Linmo is low, and even with the extra voltage potential it sustains, it still ends up with a lower specific energy than current market-leading chemistries. This slide from CATL does an excellent job of summarizing this. We can clearly see the high nickel, lower voltage chemistries edge out the high voltage Linmo chemistry by about 10%. The high voltage just doesn't quite close the gap. One thing I underestimated was how much voltage affects the specific energy of the battery. Even a 0.1 volt increase can have a significant impact on specific energy. We'll come back to this when we restack our new battery chemistry. As a point of clarification, all watt hour per kilogram numbers I provided in this video will be at the cell level. In the technical deep dive video, I offered a potential alternative route to hitting 385 watt-hours per kilogram by increasing the cell diameter. Cell diameter is the second major area where my speculation was off. I suggested that increasing the cell diameter could increase the energy density. I still see this as a possibility, but the impact of changing the diameter wouldn't be as drastic as I calculated in that video. To understand why, 
we need to look at how increasing the diameter would increase energy density. When the diameter of a battery cell is increased, it of course becomes larger. Larger objects have lower surface area in proportion to volume. This means a larger battery cell has less casing material by weight and more active material. Therefore, the cell has a higher specific energy density. I suggested that the increase in specific energy would be proportional to volume. That would look something like this, if it were true. That is, a small change to diameter having a big impact on specific energy. But that's incorrect. When we change the diameter of a cell, it actually has a less drastic impact. It would look something more like this. This graph takes into account the surface area to volume ratio, rather than just the volume. As you can see, changing the diameter has an impact on energy density, but it's not huge. Let's run the numbers on a diameter increase with better information. I advised in the technical deep dive video that when Tesla moved from the 18650, to 2170 cell size, it yielded a 3% specific energy density increase. I found a better resource, which is a paper by Jason B. Quinn et al. They calculated it should be more like 2%, so I'll use that number. Instead of getting the 21% increase in energy density by doubling the diameter, it would be more like 5%, although 5% is disappointing compared to 21% it's still quite an impact. The real benefit of increasing the cell size would be to decrease manufacturing complexity. Here is another illustration from Jason's research paper showing that the roughly 33% increase in volume means 33% fewer cells. 33% fewer cells means 33% fewer cell casings, jelly rolls, electrolyte fillings, and connections to weld. There was some good feedback in the comments about the structure that cylindrical cells add to Tesla vehicles, and for that reason, the diameter couldn't be changed. However, that doesn't seem to be the case from my research. Tesla chose cylindrical cells because they were cheaper, widely available, and the cell wall provided structure to the cell itself, which made the cell more durable. If the cells truly were that important to vehicle structure, then removing and adding battery cells to the vehicles would affect the vehicle structure. Tesla removes and adds cells to the pack often, and I know of no cases where it affected vehicle structure. The symptoms would be reduced crashworthiness and poor handling. If these things were happening, I'm sure there would be an uproar. The last major error I made was using an incorrect slide for Scylla nanotechnologies. This slide shows the performance of their cathode material rather than their silicon anode material. This was just a case of me jumping the gun when I found the research. I assumed that Scylla was only working on silicon anodes and didn't realize they were also working on cathodes. The silicon anode material has pretty well been kept under wraps and there doesn't seem to be any research information in the public sphere. This is a good time to discuss why I chose Scylla Nanotechnologies as the supplier for the high silicon anode, Nano One as the supplier for the single crystal cathode, and Celion as a manufacturing partner. As a quick reminder, a single crystal cathode means that the cathode materials have an additional coating that reduces cracking, which makes the cathode material more durable. Jean Berdachevsky is the co-founder and CEO of Scylla. Jean was employee number seven at Tesla, and he was instrumental in solving some of the early battery challenges the company faced with the Roadster. Kurt Kelty is Scylla's VP of Automotive. Kurt was senior director of battery technology at Tesla for over 10 years and was the mastermind behind Gigafactory and the Panasonic partnership. As we mentioned earlier, Judith Alvarado, who worked with Shirley Mung, is now also working at Scylla. It's either a very small world or Scylla has something special. As for Nano One, there are many companies that can produce single crystal coatings, such as CATL in China. To compete, any startup will need a good process and plenty of capital. Nano One appears to have both. They have a streamlined process for producing their materials, and here is a snapshot of their assets versus liabilities, which appear to be rock solid. 
This is why I chose Nano 1 of all the possibilities. As a side note, this is not investment advice. It's very possible that Tesla could manufacture some of these battery materials in-house, use another producer, or acquire a producer. And finally, Silion. This is already a done deal. The founders were hired by Tesla. This was public information available on their LinkedIn profiles. Previously, they listed that they were working for Tesla, but that's now been changed back to Celion. However, the website is still down for Celion, so it looks like it's closed for business. Additionally, the PDF document that I referenced in my video is no longer available online. It appears someone has been doing some scrubbing. Beyond that, Tesla is hiring people in Colorado, right next door to Celion. Thanks again to Galileo Russell for this excellent breadcrumb. Moving along, let's take a look at the first new piece of information. The best place to start is the gap we now have in our battery chemistry. Earlier we talked about the lithium nickel manganese oxide chemistry. It was cobalt free, but it didn't have high specific energy, and it couldn't hit 1 million miles under real life testing conditions. The best place to look for a million mile battery is Jeff Don's lab at Dalhousie University which happens to be Tesla's exclusive research partner. Tesla uses a battery chemistry called NCA, or nickel-cobalt-aluminum. It's mostly nickel, probably around 85 to 90 percent, 2.8 percent cobalt, and the remaining 7 to 12 percent being aluminum. At the atomic level, it's a layered structure. The NCA material forms sheets. In between those sheets is where the lithium ions hang out. When you charge the battery, it forces the ions to exit the sheets and move to the anode side. If those sheets break down, then the ions can't exit the sheet and you lose battery life. Cobalt was added because it was thought to keep those sheets clean, orderly, and well-structured. However, since those early studies were done, the process to create these layers has improved. Due to this, there's been a question in the scientific community as to whether the cobalt was even needed anymore and could be replaced by extra nickel. The push to remove cobalt is for three reasons. Nickel has a similar energy capacity, it's one-fifth the cost of cobalt, and it's difficult to source cobalt that hasn't been mined by children in a mud pit. No company in their right mind wants that association. Aluminum was added to the chemistry because it adds thermal stability and safety. It's cheap at one-sixth the cost of nickel and one-thirtieth the cost of cobalt. It's plentiful and it doesn't have the public image risks of cobalt. It doesn't add much energy capacity to the cell, but it might be possible to reduce the aluminum content to 5%, which would allow for very high nickel, which would of course mean high energy density. This brings us to nickel. You can only stuff so much nickel in a battery before the particles start to crack and cause unwanted reactions inside the battery. These unwanted reactions reduce battery life. Nickel needs a bit of assistance to hold itself together. Enter this paper by Jeff's team, led by Hong Yong Li et al., titled Is Cobalt Needed in Nickel-Rich Positive Electrode Materials for Lithium-Ion Batteries? I'll translate the abstract. But first, we need to understand what it's talking about when it mentions phase transitions. When you charge and discharge a battery, the alignment of the crystal structure changes. This is called phase transition. When the crystal structure changes, it affects the flow of ions in and out of the cathode sheets we mentioned earlier. If these changes are large and the crystal structure changes a lot, it's an indication that the material isn't as stable and will degrade sooner. There are two ways to test these phase transitions. The first is to measure the voltage and current, which will show spikes where there is a large phase transition. The second is to take x-rays. Let's go back to the translation of the abstract. NCA is a widely used chemistry. The cobalt and aluminum are believed to add safety. However, there's no proof that cobalt adds safety. We tested the phase transitions of multiple chemistries to test this. We started with a high nickel chemistry and then swapped doping materials in and out. These other doping materials were cobalt, 
aluminum, manganese, and magnesium. The high nickel chemistry that had no doping and the high nickel chemistry with cobalt had huge phase transitions. The high nickel chemistry doped with magnesium, aluminum, or manganese were all very stable. In fact, just as stable as the widely used NCA chemistry. We then tested to see what effect cobalt, aluminum, manganese, and magnesium had on battery cell flammability. All of them suppressed flammability except for cobalt, which took off like a rocket. We believe we need to get this cobalt shit out of batteries immediately, and we hope you start researching these cobalt-free materials as well. Tesla's choice to go with NCA chemistry years ago has turned out to be an excellent choice for the long run. Over the years, as more evidence has come out that cobalt isn't needed, they've reduced the amount of cobalt in the battery. This research puts a nail in the coffin of cobalt. I expect Tesla will use nickel aluminum rather than nickel manganese because it would be a logical evolution of their nickel cobalt aluminum chemistry. I expect the nickel manganese would be the least likely choice because of the three low flammability doping agents, it was the most flammable. We'll refer to the nickel aluminum cathode as NA9505, which stands for 95% nickel and 5% aluminum. Based on this graph from CATL, the similar NMC chemistry has experienced a roughly 10% increase in energy density for a 30% increase in nickel fraction, or roughly a 1 to 3 ratio. If that ratio held for Tesla's NCA chemistry as well, which is probably around 85 to 90% nickel, the increase to 95% nickel content could yield a 2-3% specific energy density improvement. Split the difference, and that's a 2.5% improvement. We'll come back to this number when we restack our cell. However, there's one thing that's needed before cobalt can be completely removed. That one thing is a single crystal coating. As I suggested earlier, these coatings reduce cracking in the cathode material. This is especially true for high nickel cathodes that are susceptible to cracking. Why is a single crystal coating so effective at preventing degradation? This would require its own deep dive video, but the cliff notes are that the coating is made of titanium. Titanium is one of the most corrosion resistant, durable, and lightweight materials known to man. Note that the research paper on screen was led by Lin Ma at Jeff Don's lab, and the titanium material being referenced was the same that was used in the testing for the Million Mile Battery research paper. After the cobalt removal paper was published, later in the year, in September, Jeff's team at Dalhousie went on to drop a bombshell paper that lays out a benchmark chemistry for a Million Mile Battery. The paper, led by Jesse Harlow, was titled A Wide Range of Testing Results on an Excellent Lithium-Ion Cell Chemistry to be Used as Benchmarks for New Battery Technologies. We'll just refer to it as the Million Mile Battery Paper. A quick summary of the paper is that a single crystal cathode with the right combination of electrolyte solution and additives can hit 4,000 cycles in abusive conditions. The cathode material was NMC532. This just means that it was 50% nickel, 30% cobalt, and 20% manganese. The testing took three years for the long-term cycling tests. However, within a few weeks, they would have gotten indicative results with high-precision coulometry and known they were on to something. If you want to know what high-precision coulometry is, check out my Jeff Don video. They could have then started to test the single crystal nickel aluminum cathode with these same electrolytes. If that's the case, why haven't we seen such research from Jeff Don's lab? As we mentioned earlier, there is an exclusive research agreement between Jeff Don and Tesla. I imagine if they did do these tests, it's commercial confidential. Testing the cobalt-free chemistry with the same type of additives and coatings as the Million Mile Battery would have been the next logical step and exactly what Tesla is looking for. If you look closely, you'll notice another benefit of the Million Mile Battery chemistry. It operated at 4.3 volts instead of the usual 4.2. 
That's a 0.1 volt increase. In the Tech Deep Dive video, my calculations for the effect of a voltage increase were incorrect. I would have calculated this 0.1 volt increase as the 2.4% increase from 4.2 to 4.3 volts. However, the base voltage of a lithium ion battery is 3 volts. This means the jump would actually be from 1.2 to 1.3 volts, which is an 8.3% increase. Let's take a look at the second new piece of information. Maxwell stated in their marketing material that their dry battery electrode technology would improve energy density by 10%. I didn't elaborate in the technical deep dive video why this might be the case. I see two potential ways the dry electrode could boost battery specific energy. The first is straightforward. With a dry electrode coating, there is less inert material and more active material per unit of mass. In other words, there's less junk and more good stuff. Let's see if we can work out how much more. I found some great in-depth information from a research paper titled Solvent-Free Additive Manufacturing of Electrodes for Lithium-Ion Batteries by Brandon Ludwig. Typically, a wet slurry electrode is 10% binder and graphite. With a dry coating, this can be reduced to 1% each and still provide similar durability and conductivity to a wet slurry coating. This means that a dry coating offers an 8% increase in energy density. However, this was a lab situation and not yet a fully commercialized product. The commercial product may find a balance point that seeks greater durability and conductivity. 8% would be our theoretical maximum, unless there is some other magic happening with the dry battery electrode that we don't know about. Given our improvement range of 0% to 8%, I'd view Maxwell's 10% claim with skepticism. However, a 5% increase seems perfectly reasonable. We'll revisit this number when we restack the cell. The second might allow for beyond a 10% increase in specific energy. I noticed in quite a bit of the Maxwell collateral, the cathode thickness frequently came up. Most battery cathodes are 100 micrometers thick. Maxwell was aiming for a cathode that was 200 to 300 micrometers thick. I didn't realize the significance of this until I ran a calculation on the impact of a thicker cathode. If I've calculated this correctly, it looks like a 25% increase in cathode thickness would mean a 10% increase in energy density at the cell level. Conventional batteries using a wet slurry process can coat thicker than 100 micrometers. However, cathodes aren't coated much thicker than this because the ions have a difficult time pushing through the extra thick cathode. That means more heat and slower charge and discharge rates. In fact, cathodes are often made thicker or thinner depending on the application. Thicker cathodes are higher energy density but lower output and thinner cathodes are higher output and lower energy density. For reference, power is how quickly a cell puts out electricity, and energy is how much electricity it stores. This presents us with a tricky problem. I've created this triangle to represent it. If we move to any corner of this triangle, we move further away from the other corners. This means Tesla couldn't significantly increase charge and discharge rate, increase cell size, and increase cell diameter all at the same time. If you want a higher discharge and charge rate, you generate more heat. If you want a thicker cathode for more energy density, you generate more heat. If you want a bigger cell for ease of manufacturing, the battery would be harder to cool. In order to beat the triangle problem, you need to shrink the triangle. There are three ways to do this. One. Maxwell dry battery electrode technology is more conductive and allows quicker and deeper access into the cathode material. This means less heat and faster charging and discharging. 2. A better cooling system. This one is obvious, but we'll go into some options below. 3. Supercapacitors, aka supercaps. Maxwell also specializes in supercaps which have no issues with soaking up and discharging huge amounts of power quickly. For number one, as I stated in the Model Y scaling video, Maxwell's dry battery electrode technology 
will likely be implemented for Tesla's new in-house battery cell, but not for their legacy cells. Hold that thought for the restacking we'll do later in the video. To better understand the cooling opportunity, here's an illustration of the Tesla Model 3 cooling system. There are three ways to improve upon this. One, each cooling band has two rows of cells. The number of cooling bands could be doubled. A higher energy density cell would make space for this. Two, total immersion, which was illustrated in this patent in the terawatt scaling video. Three, tab cooling or plate cooling, which we haven't discussed before. Thanks to Sagan on sustainability who brought this to my attention. Researchers have found that cooling the ends of batteries is extremely effective. The ends contain battery tabs, which are connected to the cathode and anode foil. Cooling the battery ends conducts through the entire battery. If the Cybertruck, Roadster, or Semi has two layers of batteries, they will almost certainly need to do this. Tesla has made improvements to cooling in the past. With a new battery chemistry comes new battery cell physics. With new cell physics comes a new pack design, especially if Tesla moves to cell-to-pack technology discussed in the terawatt scaling video. Elon has said several times that supercaps won't be used in Tesla vehicles. This is a large subject area and beyond the scope of this video. In short, the cost-benefit of supercaps may not be enough to make them worthwhile. I'll take Elon at his word on this and cross supercaps off our list. With these three options in mind, Tesla can shrink the triangle. However, they would need to make some trade-off decisions, which will be discussed in a moment. In light of all this new information, let's restack our battery cell. In the Model Y scaling video, I suggested Tesla would continue working with Panasonic in the near future. With that in mind, we need two predictions. One prediction for the 2170 and 18650 cells, and another prediction for what will be in the Tesla manufactured cell. I'll refer to the 18650 and 2170 as the legacy format and the Tesla cell as the advanced format. I expect both the legacy and advanced format to use a cobalt-free million mile battery. This will be achieved with a high nickel, slightly higher voltage, single crystal coated cathode made of nickel and aluminum and a dollhousey special electrolyte. In 2019, CATL had prismatic, high nickel batteries sprinkled with silicon that were achieving 270 watt-hours per kilogram. Earlier, I mentioned that Tesla could achieve even higher nickel contents, allowing for a 2.5% specific energy density improvement. If that's the case, this would push the specific energy density to 277 watt-hours per kilogram. This is my low-end estimate for Tesla's legacy chemistry. I'm assuming this is a 4.2 volt chemistry. If the battery management systems of the Model S, X, Y, and 3 can handle 4.3 volts, we might expect 300 watt-hours per kilogram. This would be the 8.3% boost from the 0.1 volt increase discussed earlier, which could be multiplied in to the 277 watt-hours per kilogram base number. We'll cap the legacy chemistry at 300 watt-hours per kilogram, because a high-loaded silicon anode may not be compatible with wet slurry-based cells. The advanced format would use the full 4.3 volts and have a specific energy of around 300 watt-hours per kilogram as a base number. This is based on my speculation of a new battery pack and battery management system, which could be designed to handle 4.3 volts. Returning to the Maxwell dry battery electrode, the 5% increase from a denser cathode material would increase the energy density on our 300 watt-hour per kilogram battery cell to 315 watt-hours per kilogram. Our next options are a thicker cathode and a larger cell diameter. This brings us back to the triangle problem. I'll speculate that Tesla will not go with a thicker cathode. The thicker cathode and anode would offer great energy density improvements have the largest negative impact on the charge and discharge rate. Battery cathodes and anodes are like parking lots for ions. 
The surface of those materials are like exit and entry roads. If you keep the same number of entry and exit roads, increasing the parking lot size means more traffic at the entry and exit points. This means it's harder to get in and out. In our battery cell, this means more resistance, which in turn means more heat and slower discharge and charge rates. Instead, my view is that Tesla will keep the increased charge and discharge rates that Maxwell's technology provides, which will also keep the battery cooler. This will allow for an increase in cell diameter. However, even with less heat generation, the cell would be more difficult to cool and warm because it's thicker. This could be dealt with by an improved thermal management system, potentially one of the three options mentioned above. A larger cell diameter would normally mean lots of retooling and millions in capital expense. However, if they are creating a new battery line anyways, this shouldn't incur any additional cost, but would save money and increase manufacturing line speed significantly. The diameter increase would also net another 5% in specific energy. This would bring us up to 330 watt hours per kilogram. What about the 385 to 390 watt hour per kilogram battery I suggested in past videos? That's still attainable, but probably at least four to five years away from commercial production. There may be a loophole to this, which we'll discuss in a moment. But first, we need to understand why silicon is so difficult to incorporate into batteries. The issue with a high silicon anode is that it expands and contracts by several hundred percent as the battery charges and discharges. This causes the battery materials to become unstuck from each other and the electrode foil. Maxwell claims that the dry battery electrode has a better sticky factor, which makes sense given that it has the consistency of bubble gum. This means the dry battery electrode may be a prerequisite for a high silicon anode. If Maxwell and Silion can get the high loaded silicon anode to stick, it would be pretty astounding. My wild speculation is that this is what Tesla is working on in Colorado with Silion, and they are attempting to accelerate this technology from four to five years to maybe just a few years. A high loaded silicon anode with a nickel rich cathode would top out at around 400 watt hours per kilogram, which is the theoretical limit for this type of chemistry. With a restacked chemistry and new information, let's compare the odds table from the tech deep dive video against our final update. Once again, this is what I expect to be in production within one year from battery investor day. As you can see, we start in the same place, but the taper is much stronger. Let's put this into perspective. If Tesla gets to 300 watt hours per kilogram, that's industry leading. If the battery is also 1 million miles and cobalt free, we'd be looking at the culmination of 40 years of work by Jeff Don. Jeff was one of the pioneers of the lithium ion battery. He was probably fifth in line behind Goodenough, Whittingham, and Yoshino when they received a Nobel Prize for the lithium-ion battery last year. A million-mile, cobalt-free battery might secure an eventual Nobel Prize for Jeff. Anything beyond 300 watt-hours per kilogram is insane. In fact, I don't even know if Tesla will even reveal the gravimetric or volumetric energy density at Battery Investor Day. Elon has been cagey about specific numbers in the past. I suspect the focus will be on 1 million miles, the magic of Jeff's additive combination, cobalt free, cost per kilowatt hour, a new pack design with reduced pack weight, the impact on range, the impact on charging speed, and the impact on performance. One last point to cover, and to get your opinion on, is that there were several comments suggesting that Tesla would pull out of Giga Nevada very soon or by the end of the year. My opinion is that's unlikely, for three reasons. One, Tesla would need to produce or find 40 gigawatt hours of cells and fast, and Panasonic would need to find someone to buy those cells fast. I don't know of any way Tesla could replace those cells in the next few years, or anyone who has use for 40 gigawatt hours of cells from Panasonic. Two, 
It would be a huge waste of capital, energy, and effort for both parties. The battery lines are like money printers. There's no reason to shut them down for any time frame if the demand is there. 3. Just a few months ago, Panasonic suggested they were ready to ramp to 54 gigawatt hours of production. I doubt they'd be saying this if they were planning on pulling out soon. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, so let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe. I also have a Patreon, Twitter, and a subreddit. You can find the details of those in the description. A special thanks to Joel Sapp, Johan Kanagenjelm, and Bears on a Submarine for your generous support of the channel, and all the other patrons listed in the credits. I appreciate all of your support, and thanks for tuning in.